Okay, um, we're ready to start. Welcome everybody to uh, the event tonight on Brexit. Um, my name is Ruben Zayotti. I'm the director of the, Euro uh, the Jean Monnet European Union Center of Excellence here at Dalhousie University and one of the co-sponsors of this event. Uh, the other sponsor is the law faculty. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, the law faculty for hosting the event and, uh, and Aldo in particular to uh, help in the organization of uh, uh, the round table tonight. As, as you, I assume, are aware, the topic is uh, definitely a hot one, not just uh, in the UK, as you might imagine, but uh, across Europe and I would say also in North America. And uh, if you believe in, uh, uh, in subtle messages that are sent by Theresa May, I think that the, the fact that we're having an event tonight on Brexit is quite telling. Not only she was yesterday in Ottawa, here in Canada, she was talking about CETA, uh, so the, 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 the agreement, the, the trade agreement between Canada and the EU, but also making references to uh, Northern Ireland. So we have, uh, although coming from, um, from Ireland, but also a reference to one of the speakers here, and also to the fact that uh, uh, on Friday she's going to be delivering a major speech um, on Brexit and UK-EU relations in the future in Florence, so in Italy, which is the country of the other speaker uh, of tonight. So we have, and of course, uh, Tessa is you know, based here in Canada. So as I said, I think Theresa May, the Pre UK Prime Minister, was sending us some signals that we needed to have this event tonight. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, without much further ado, I want to start with uh, um, tonight's roundtable. We're going to start with uh, Vincent Power, uh, who's going to be providing sort of a, a, the big picture of the, of the issues that we're going to be discussing today. Um, in particular, it's, it's not just about what's going on now, but the, the future of, uh, of Brexit. That, that's where the title is coming from. And then the other two speakers are going to be discussing some other aspects of the, um, of the issue um, of Brexit. So I'm going to introduce each of the speakers when they are uh, ready to come to the podium. So I'll start with Vincent. Um, uh, because Vincent is Vincent, um, I'm going to uh, be very brief. I mean, I could talk about him for a long time, but uh, Dr. Vincent Power is a partner in uh, ANL Good Body specializing in EU law, uh, EU and Irish comp competition antitrust law, regulation law, and transport law. He's a head of the firm's EU competition and procurement group. An award-winning lawyer, Vincent has advice on most of the leading competition, merger control, EU cartel, state aid, and related litigation cases, as well as cartel immunity applications in Ireland for over 20 years, including the major takeovers. Um, um, he advises both national and multinational clients, as well as public and private clients in almost every economic sector. And as I said, I'm not going to cover all the, the, uh, what uh, uh, Vincent does. He works at night as well. So you might not be surprised to see him here in Canada working while everybody else is sleeping. Um, so thanks, uh, Vincent, for coming here. And the podium to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Ruben. Thank you for an introduction that my mother would love to hear but my wife would never believe. Um, I have been given four and a half hours uh, to try and describe for you the background to Brexit, what is Brexit, and to some extent what's going to happen next. Make a full five hours, if I might? Three and a half. For three and a half, okay. Now, before I go into the detail, I try to think of some way of conveying to you where we are with Brexit. And the best way to think about it is as a magician. There was a magician who stood in front of an audience just like you, though the audience wasn't as distinguished, and he asked them for a watch, and you handed them a wristwatch. And he hand held up the wristwatch, and it was the most amazing wristwatch the world had ever seen. It had been created 60 years ago, it had been developed over that time. It had been yours for 40 years. But the magician decried the watch, saying it was inefficient. It cost so much. 
if you could only give that watch and spend the money, the health service would have 350 million every week. <laughs> and it was so inefficient, it only told you the time of one time zone at a time, and it lost time, and it was so expensive. And the magician, what he did was, he laid it down in front of the table, and he got a big red cloth, and he put it on the, and he got a huge hammer that his friends Nigel and Boris and Michael had made. <laughs> and he lifted it, and the whole world looked that Thursday night and said, no, 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 they are not going to break that watch, are they? And the big hammer went up, and it smashed. And then he took all the pieces, and he held them up like that, and you were all aghast. And he looked at the watch in pieces, and you looked at the magician, and you said, well, surely you're now going to do the next part of the trick and put it all back together again, aren't you? We need to tell the time. And the magician looked at the audience, and he said, I don't know the second part of the trick. And his lovely assistant, who never saw herself as her lovely assistant, said, well, magic is magic. Or Brexit is Brexit. And that's the problem. 450, 454 days ago, we had a referendum. We did that part of the trick. 17 million people came out, and they voted like never before. Uh, like a single proposition. Never have so many people in the United Kingdom voted for a single proposition before. They voted for Brexit, but they don't know what happens next. It is exactly the same as jumping off the cliff at Acapulco. When you jump off the cliff, you make sure there's no water down beneath you. Because by the time you hit it, the tide comes in. The danger is, if you actually jump when there's water there, the tide will have gone out. So we're in that space, we don't know what happens next. So what I'm going to try and do is, in 20 minutes, to set the scene and provide an overview, to consider the issue from the UK perspective and the Irish perspective. And you might wonder why Ireland is so important. Uh, it is going to be the country that is most affected by Brexit, if Brexit occurs. And then to consider the process and to identify some of the key issues. So, first of all, and very simply, it's a very obvious issue, is what is Brexit? Well, legally it's very straightforward. It's simply the withdrawal by the United Kingdom and Gibraltar from the European Union and the European Atomic Energy Community. But in fact, it's much more than that. Not only do they leave, perhaps, from the customs union and the internal market, though that's not yet certain, but actually the United Kingdom would be leaving the European Union. 10% of the population, but a very important member, because not only have been, they've been there for 43 years, when you think about it, the United Kingdom has been in the European Union longer than the President of France, Macron, has been alive. <laughs> it is in their DNA. It took them 12 years to negotiate to get in, and over four decades, it has permeated every area of law and every area of life. So it is going to be a huge phenomenon. Now, I've got a lot of detail in these slides. I'm not going to go through all of the detail. I'm just going to pick out a number of points. I'm going to say, for example, on this point, that a lot of Brexiteers and Eurosceptics and Europhobes said it'll be the end of the European Union. In fact, what's happened is the 27th, have actually remained very tightly bound together. And what they see in some way is that the troublesome wheel, the one that slowed down the carriage, is actually going to be removed. And that's very interesting. Now, I think it's a great pity if the UK leaves, but it is not at all clear that it will be the breaking of the European Union. In fact, according to some who will actually see further integration and further perhaps federalism, they would see this as the making of the European Union. And still, the concept of Brexit, Theresa May said Brexit means Brexit. The problem with that is, don't try that in a jurisprudential exam. You know, what is realist jurisprudence? Realist jurisprudence means realist jurisprudence. There'll be no marks for you. But the problem is that nobody yet knows what Brexit is. In fact, it is a whole plethora of different concepts. The media talk about a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit. 
And as I'll mention later, there is no such choice. What there is, is a spectrum of Brexits. Either the UK leaves and it is leave and it's a third country, like a country in Asia that has very little contact with the European Union, or it is somewhere along that spectrum where it's a little bit like Canada with the CETA or a little bit closer uh, like Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein with the EEA. It is a spectrum and we just don't know yet where we're going to land on that spectrum. And all of this is due to take place by the 29th of March 2019. As I say, it took two attempts and 12 years to get into the European Union by the UK. To extricate themselves in two years is actually impossible. Now, why is it so difficult? Why is Brexit proving to be difficult? Well, it's proving to be difficult because no member state has ever left the European Union. There are 28 member states, 26 member states joined, they acceded, they knew what they were getting into because there was a road map for them, but no member state has ever left. Algeria, Greenland and St. Barthélemy did leave, but they were not member states. They were not members of the UN Security Council, not members of the G7, not such an important economic, political, military powerhouse as the United Kingdom. So it is difficult. Now the way the EU27 have looked at it, and you saw Guy Verstoff said it yesterday, Michel Barnier has said it before, is, okay, you've made this decision, now tell us what you're going to do. So for example, a simple issue about the border between the UK and Ireland, you've made this choice, now tell us, come to us with imaginative solutions. And the position even in the UK is unclear. Bloomberg reported this morning that perhaps Boris Johnson was, as Bloomberg put it, living on Boris time uh, because they weren't sure whether or not he would resign over the speech in Florence on Friday. Um, the you know, essay that he wrote for the Daily Telegraph last Saturday, uh, you know, it is not a united view within the United Kingdom as to how they will leave or indeed what they want to leave to. Uh, so that's the, the problem. It is, it is far from certain and far from clear. Now, it's also difficult because there is now disagreement on even how quickly it wants to leave. The Chancellor of the Exchequer would like some sort of transition arrangement. Others want to be gone immediately. Even the very fact that they could have had the referendum on the 23rd of June 2016, the party conference in... Uh, Birmingham in October, but not actually served the notice to the 29th of March, just shows the, the need for thought. And even still, even in August, when the UK was presenting papers to the Commission, uh, it wasn't very clear from those papers. I read them, and it's still not clear what they actually want. The tone of the negotiation is very polite. It's polite aggression. Um, it's very nicely done on both sides, and they're very polite to each other, uh, but it is far from warm. Initially, the European Union was very concerned about contagion, but that has eased somewhat after the Dutch, the French elections and so on, uh, but they are still concerned about contagion. Now, so it's unprecedented, it's difficult, and now I think it's probably useful to dispel some myths, as trying to paint some of the background. Uh, Brexit is easy, we were told by the Brexiteers. In fact, it is not. It is extremely difficult. It is like waking up in the morning and deciding that you're going to speak English without using vowels. Uh, because even the Brexiteers would tell you that the European Union permeated everything in the UK life for 40 years, therefore to extricate it is very difficult. Houdini said, when he was asked how did he get out of safes, he said it's very easy. Safes are designed to keep people out, not designed to keep people in. The European Union, however, is designed to keep people in and keep everybody very close together. People say Brexit will be the death knell of the UK. No, the UK will survive. Now, I think there's a famous Canadian, the most famous Canadian in the UK, uh, Mark Carney, who would say that it is going to stunt growth and so on, and he may well be right. We just don't know. We haven't done this experiment before. Uh, Brexit is a new phenomenon, another myth. The first Brexit really occurred, there was a chap who had an idea at one stage to take back control from those foreign capitals in Europe, make laws 
in England. Do it all in the English language and stop paying money to those foreigners in that foreign capital, Rome. And he'd like to divorce six women at a time. <laughs> the first Brexit was the Reformation. And look how that worked out. Um, <laughs> now, Brexit was all to do with Trump. Well, when you go back and you look at the media, the social media and print media from the 23rd of June, Trump wasn't doing so well at that time. It was a long-standing, well-honed concept which was there for a long time. The vote was tight. It wasn't. The gap was 1.7 million. That's the entire population of Manchester, Edinburgh, Bristol, Belfast, and Cardiff. That's a lot of people. London and Scotland were for Remain. That was OK. No. 40.1% of the people of London voted to leave. 38.1% of the Scottish population voted to leave. Brexit will never happen. Right now, you've got to assume it will. Brexit is irreversible. Now that they've served the notice, there's no going back. Now, lawyers will debate this for a long time. I think politicians, if the UK were to decide to come back, much like Bobby Ewing coming out of the shower, Dallas isn't so popular here. Um, <laughs> then, or you're all too young, <laughs> yes, or not watching enough daytime television. Um, <laughs> Brexit is irreversible. Politicians, I think it could be reversible. I think legally there's a good argument that it is because Article 50 talks about serving your intention. This is the end of the EU. No, it will not be the end of the EU. Now, very quickly about the UK's perspective, I'd just like to say that that is an ex a series of examples where they had second thoughts about whether they should join, whether they should remain members, about fees, about the Maastricht social chapter, about EMU and monetary union, Schengen and so on. It was a semi-detached relationship from the start and it has always been semi-detached. So it was something which was bound to happen. Now, the only thing I just mentioned here is the 75 referendum, which was quite interesting. The bottom half of the UK in 75 were the ones who were in favour of remaining. The top half were the ones who were against remaining. And in 2016, it was reversed. So maybe the next referendum, it could get reversed again. Why does Ireland matter? Well, Ireland matters for several reasons. It's the only member state, and I'm not getting into the Gibraltar Spanish issue uh, for a moment, but it's the only member state which is contiguous. The border between the UK and Ireland across Northern Ireland is two and a half times the length of the English Scottish border. There are about 110 million visitors, it's not that we all go several times, uh, around a common travel area on an annual basis. A lot of people work in one part of the uh, north or south and they move across. Trade-wise, the UK is Ireland's biggest trading partner and vice versa, Ireland is the fifth biggest trading partner and export market for the UK. Ireland is a more important export market for the UK than Japan, China or India. Uh, there's about a billion in trade every week. So it's hugely important, enormous uh, movement of people, but it's also very important from the peace process and the re-establishment of a border with customs posts and police and army and so on. I'm not saying the army would be there, but that sort of border and barrier could cause problems. And the European Commission recognised this. That's why it was one of the three items which had to be addressed at the outset. And indeed, Theresa May, in her letter uh, triggering Article 50, did so as well. It's the top page of the fifth, top of the fifth page of that letter. So it is an extremely important part. You could find, just like CETA and the Wallonian Parliament almost derailed uh, the CETA agreement, you could find that depending on the construct or the structure of the Brexit agreement, there might be a referendum in Ireland. Uh, if there are powers ceded by member states to the European Union, then in certain circumstances, referenda are necessary in Ireland. And it could be, um, you know, 500 million people being decided upon by 5 million people in a referendum. Very quickly, what's the Brexit process? Well, as I say, a member state leaving is entirely unprecedented. There was no provision explicitly providing that you could leave until Article 50 of the TEU was added. In that context, uh, it's an unusual provision. It's very short. 
Uh, it explicitly says a member state may leave. You serve your intention to the council that you're going to leave, and then a decision has to be reached, an agreement has to be reached. That two-year period, which is provided for in Article 50, uh, could be extended. There's no guarantee that it would be, but it is just possible that it might be. Or what you may well find is that the, fifth, the two years is, is ended, but there are transitional arrangements. And I think that there will almost inevitably be some sort of transitional arrangements that are there. Discussions are underway uh, between David Davis from the UK side, Michel Barnier on the European Commission side. Personally, I think they're designed not to succeed because, at least in public, Typically, the way the European Union does things, it solves problems, but it does so late and sometimes in a quite a troublesome or tricky way. And if you saw that in the Grexit negotiations, for example, you saw it in the banking crisis, you know, the markets are about to open and will there be a decision? Everything is done at midnight or at a minute past midnight. And you may well find that on the 29th of March, there's the suggestion that EU law will be switched off in the UK at midnight. So at the moment, it would be very unusual if there was to be a resolution of everything along the way. It is a, like a trade union negotiation, like an employer's discussion, it is everything is agreed and nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So it's going to be quite tricky. And the UK agenda is not clear. The fact that Theresa May had to give a speech in Lancaster House in January and another one now in Florence on Friday uh, and there will be another speech and another speech trying to set out the agenda and when you have ministers threatening to resign or whatever over the content of that, it is not a clear direction, it is not a clear cut uh, destination and that makes it an extremely difficult process. So the process itself, four parts, very straightforward, the referendum, the notification, the negotiation, and the departure. So we've had the referendum, as I say, only the third UK referendum nationwide ever, but the largest uh, voters in, in favour of any proposition. The notification, the Article 50 letter, was served on the 29th of March. The negotiations are ongoing. There are a group of Sherpas who are doing the real work with some face-to-face -face negotiations and so on. There's been some progress, but not a huge amount. This will culminate in a series of summits which will do the work, and particularly one at the end. The idea that the UK had was that sufficient progress would be made by October, that actually the trade negotiations would commence at that stage. That's not happening. I think in all probability. They're scheduled to leave on the 29th of March 2019 and the bottom line is it's not that simple. So a few points in general terms. First of all, Brexit is not a simple choice between hard and soft. It is a Brexit spectrum as I mentioned earlier. And the reason for that is one of the key parts is the internal market. The way the European Union works is that from, Atle, or from the Atlantic to Athens and from Sweden to Sicily, you can move anything around. Goods, persons, capital, payments, services, everything can move around. And that's one of the problems. If, and one of the things that emerged from the referendum was that people seem to prefer goods over people. They said, we have no problem with goods moving, we just don't like the people. And when history looks back in the UK at the beginning of the 21st century, that's an interesting reflection. We want our goods to move, we just don't like the people. And that's a serious point. But the internal market is a stitched, coordinated, coherent whole. It comes with the people, it comes with the goods, it comes with everything. And what would a soft Brexit look like? Well, a soft Brexit would look like that they would have access to the internal market. But that's the big choice. Now, the European Union has not yielded in any way to the UK. Perhaps it should. There are opportunities and ways in which it could yield to the UK. But it has basically stonewalled the UK since the 23rd of June uh, last year. The soft Brexit would be freedom, some financial contribution. The UK is an important contributor to the European Union. The Court of Justice, 
And you know, when Boris Johnson came out in February of 2016, that Sunday afternoon out of his house, I watched it live, uh, and he said that he was going to go, because it was unclear which way he would go, he said, I'll go for the Brexit side. And he said, and I'm objecting to the Court of Justice. And I thought, my God, you know, never before have sort of jurisprudence swung a referendum. Um, but he was attacking the fact that the Court of Justice were judges, deciding matters, the supremacy of EU law over the UK and so on. It was an interesting target to actually pick in a referendum because they're the one institution of the European Union who will not speak back. The judges don't speak out loud, uh, you know, compared to the council or the parliament or whoever. Um, the hard Brexit could be very simple. Now, I don't think it will be completely as hard as that. It will be along a softer line. So there are various opportunities there in terms of the opportunities that will go through, and it will be uh, in that way. Now, there is a whole range of legal issues that can be triggered, and any area that you want to talk about and can deal with in questions can be covered by Brexit. How will all this end? Bottom line is, no one knows. It can be resolved. It will be likely to take years. There will be transitional arrangements and implementation ones. Don't believe everything you hear. Okay? There's a lot of shadow negotiations going on. Uh, don't confuse steps with the journey. Don't confuse activity with accomplishment. Um, to give you a sense of how difficult it is to work out what it, what, what it is, Craig Oliver, who was David Cameron's communications director, has written a really good book. It's well worth reading. And he describes the Thursday night in number 10 Downing Street, two hours before the polls closed. He describes how David Cameron and Samantha and all the people working there, they were laying out this table in number 10 with Moussaka and Elderflower. Okay? The Cameron number 10 was not the court of Caligula. Um, what they felt was they were going to win 52-48. Now, if number 10 Downing Street, two hours out from the polls closing, couldn't work it out, how can anyone work out two years? And it's even going to be longer than two years. So I'm going to leave you with a number of thoughts. Um, it is unprecedented, it is unclear, and it is uncertain. All of the rules will not be written by the time uh, the UK leaves. That is not necessarily a problem. That photograph taken there on the 25th of March 1957 in Rome when they signed the Treaty of Rome, it's a little known fact. They did sign papers, but the Treaty of Rome was not yet fully drafted. There were various aspects of it which they yet hadn't agreed, but goodness knows they had booked the hall. <laughs> they had lined up the photographers. They had traveled far and wide. So you just go ahead with it, just like Acapulco. And it is going to be a mixture of law, politics, economics, diplomacy, sociology. It is fascinating and frightening. It's going to be the experiment, I think, of prohibition. Do you remember when the United States banned alcohol uh, because they thought it would be good for them? And then a little bit later they said, can we still have sherry trifle? <laughs> and then they repealed it. And the same thing could happen with Brexit. Because Brexit and the European Union, it's like a lobster pot. It's relatively easy to get into, but it's very difficult to get out of alive. And that's part of the problem. And the ultimate problem is this, and I'll leave you with this thought. The Brexit referendum was a referendum where everybody made the case against Europe, but nobody made the case for Europe. And if you think about something that we can all remember in our lifetimes, and I don't want to play games with numbers, but if you think of 9-11, terrible, terrible things happened on 9-11. 2,996 people died. We don't know how many people died in the Second World War. But if you take the median number, it meant that there was a 9-11 every 45 minutes, every day and every night for six years. And what the European Union has done is it has helped stop that. 
And that case for the European Union was never made. But the case against the European Union was certainly made. It carried the day. We're now living with the consequences, even with the broken watch. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Anyway, so we have the second speaker for today, which is uh, uh, Francesco Munari. Um, he's a professor of EU law at the University of Genoa uh, in Italy, and generally professor of transnational environmental law. Uh, he's been a visiting scholar at Yale University and uh, the University of Hamburg, where he taught international law, um, EU law, and European community trade law. Um, he's a partner, co-founder of law firm Munari and Associates with uh, uh, its offices in Genoa, where he acts as an avocado and arbitrator in um, civil and commercial matters, domestic and international disputes. So he's going to be talking um, about Brexit and um, providing his own perspective. Thanks, Francesco. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I can start my presentation somewhere. Uh, yes, there they are. So thank you very much. I will be touching upon a few topics that will uh, be uh, considered from the European Union perspective. Uh, so many things have been already mentioned by Vincent. I will go through uh, the approach that the Union has adopted. As Vincent uh, correctly pointed out, in fact, uh, the reaction of the 27 has been so far unprecedented because the, uh, probably the UK was believing that uh, they could trade on a bilateral basis with single EU members and uh, being uh, good negotiators and having a good tradition in diplomacy could make a profit out of that. But the, EU, uh, the Union has been leaving and has been undergoing, as many of you know, a profound uh, crisis in the past 10 years. And skepticism, or Euroscepticism, has been uh, inflating. So that the reaction has been quite smart from the Union side, namely to put at the head of negotiation a very solid French diplomat who is not particularly sympathetic with, with, uh, with the Anglicans, and to uh, keep everything very straight. Uh, the position of the Union is, as Vincent mentioned, you made the decision, we stay here and want to listen to your proposals. Uh, but some guidelines have been anyway adopted by the Union, and they have been adopted adopted uh, without very much debate inside the Union, th this demonstrating that the Union is so far very much unified. And the, the guidelines state, as this slide uh, maintains, that the purpose of the Union is to ensure the United King's, Kingdom's orderly withdrawal so as to reduce uncertainty and, to the extent possible, minimize disruption caused by, by this abrupt change. Um, this uh, evening, this event, is concentrated on life of people also. And that's something which Union cares a lot. What apparently is not the same by the United Kingdom, which has been playing with people, but there are millions and millions of people involved in this decision. Many of them live in the UK. Many UK citizens live in other member states. And it is fancy to uh, know that there is a rush of British nationals to change their nationality into other member states because they don't want to be out of this, of this situation. And that's probably unexpected by the United Kingdom government. So there, there will be many people asking for citizenship of, of, of other states of the Union because they want to preserve their rights. Because after so many years of being together, 
after so many years of being able to to freely move to get a job to 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 enjoy the union as a person this idea of becoming isolated again is unprecedented i mean there is popular people with 45 that never experienced something like being isolated like you were. So there has been a lot of investigation, who voted for the Remain, who voted for Leave, the, old, the eldest population voted mainly for Brexit, someone says, but this is not possibly the idea of young people. This sort of decision should have been explained much better, unfortunately. And that's a matter of democracy. You cannot just ask in a, such a referendum to play the, uh, the magician role of the Vincent uh, um, introduction, because you have to tell people what's going to happen. And this was never done. So the guidelines state, in the first place, we will not talk about the future of the relationship. We want first to provide as much clarity and legal certainty as possible to citizens against the first persons, the first name is always citizens, businesses, stakeholders and international partners on the immediate effects of the UK withdrawal. And then settle the disentanglement, and this is verbatim quoted, just to mean how critical this will be, of the UK from the EU. That's guidelines, verbatim quotation. And from all the rights and obligations the UK derives from commitment undertaken at member states. And there will be no agreement on the future as long as these items have been progressed sufficiently. So the idea of the UK to start talking about the future before, before settling the condition, the terms of condition of the withdrawal has unfortunately for UK, fortunately for the Union, not materialized. What are the topics that are uh, now at stake? Some of them have been already mentioned. The first one which is very important for the union negotiator is citizen rights. Who will be covered? Which rights will be covered? What will happen to a person having worked 20 years in the UK and 20 years in Germany? Will he retain his pension? Will that be calculated? As, uh, will the graduation of a person in Cambridge be valid also throughout Europe and vice versa? This will be Enormous, an enormous list of items that shall have to be covered. And if we, if we take a look of what will be probably said, not by the European Court of Justice, which could be actually set out if an hard Brexit takes place, but the European Court of Human Rights, which apparently is still judging also on UK decisions, you can imagine that if a hard Brexit will take place, there will be a lot of claims before that court that will make for the British government very difficult to resolve and to deprive millions of citizens of their rights they have acquired throughout 40 and more years of, uh, of uh, being member of the Union. Financial settlement is a big question as well because the Union has a strange financial re uh, regulation, namely the, the budget is decided on a seven-year basis. So each country contributes during these seven years for a given amount of money. Now, uh, termination will occur in March 2019, uh, but the budget period will end at the end of 2020. That means that it is to be decided whether the UK will pay the bill as a contributor for this balance until the end of the budgetary period of the Union or not. Of course, the position are opposite in the negotiation stage. And the bill that the UK may pay can be very high. And there are also a lot of other financial engagement, which at least in my, in my slide, I just mentioned the probably uh, known, well-known 
agreeing in bilateral agreement, if it is so, there is uh, three orders of the Tribunal of, uh, of Luxembourg stated that it was not an agreement, but that's a, a very, very comic question which I will may maybe address during the discussion time, in which the Union has is going to pay 6 billion euro to Turkey in order to have Turkey stop the Syrian people from entering the Union. And a big portion of this money is to be paid by the UK as a member of the Union. So that makes, on top of many other financial topics, things difficult. And then there is the issue concerning the external borders and Ireland, Northern Ireland border, which have been already dealt with by um, by Vincent, and I won't go back on them. But this is again a problem of movement of person, linkage between families, because Northern Ireland and Ireland are very close, and all of a sudden you cannot just strike a line like in North Korea, not in Western Europe, not in the third millennium. It does not work like that. It simply is not conceivable. So, and that will actually be another topic to be, to be covered. Now, if the negotiation goes on, if these three preliminary points will be covered, which is still very open to question, there will be other topics that have to be solved or sufficiently progressed before we talk about the future relationship. I, I just pick up some of them. And uh, you see that there are very many topics. Being here, uh, I, I would like to mention only some issues. Uh, one of the uh, tenets made by the, the UK government is that we will become the best partner of many third countries that now are uh, in having relationship with the, with the Union. And unfortunately, the first, uh, uh, the first hints we have of this uh, new era of a globalized UK is not working that, that, that well. Uh, because with CETA, probably there won't be any succession in the, in, the, in, the, in the treaty. So UK shall have to renegotiate from scratch a treaty with Canada. Last week or two weeks ago, uh, Mrs. May went to Japan and uh, boldly wanted to, to start negotiation with Japan for a new bilateral agreement on trade. And the Japanese uh, uh, head of government said, sorry, uh, you should stay in the line because we are now starting negotiation with the union. And when we finish with them, maybe we will have time to start negotiation with you. So, uh, I mean, for them, it won't be that easy. Um, but if, if these problems will be solved, there will be um, some formats to be considered. But uh, because the union tends to repeat its practice because it's more convenient. So I have listed four pos possible items and I'm going to finish in a while. Um, just to, know, just to let you know how far we are from reality in the negotiation or in the speeches coming from the media. Uh, for instance, the soft Brexit like uh, UK joining the EFTA, European Free Trade Area, and entering the European Economic Area would imply for the British to pay about 30% more in contributions because now the UK pays about 100 Canadian dollars per year per capita to be in the Union as a contribution to the budget. But countries like Liechtenstein, Iceland and Norway, being in the economic area, they pay more and have no decisional power. So at the end of the day, the money that should be saved from the wristwatch Vincent mentioned would be much more. A bilateral comprehensive agreement between UK and uh, the EU may be another option, but it may take time. Apparently, the soft Brexit, which is now under scrutiny by Mrs. May, is the Swiss format. Unfortunately, with Switzerland, the Union has signed 120 treaties, from exchange of students to national security or nuclear power. So how is that imaginable that in less than a year 
all this treaty be signed is, in my view, not realistic. Or being treated like associated country, like Turkey, I don't know. And the fact is that we are very close to the deadline that, and nothing has occurred yet. Something has occurred in terms of uh, showing the muscles anyway, because last week the UK Parliament approved the Bill to European, the Act, which introduced in the UK all the secondary legislation. So there's thousands and thousands, more than 10,000 statutes that have a European origin and have been implemented in the EU through this uh, European Communities Act. Uh, and they replicate actually the European Union law from an internal perspective because otherwise there would be no more, it would be a huge legal vacuum. And this is something that has been so far approved, but I, I'm not very familiar with constitutional law in the UK. It is not yet enforced, it may be subject to a second approval by the Parliament. People think that it is a grey area in respect of, of that. Um, I talk about that uh, already, about the Switzerland bill. Uh, aside of the complexity, there is a huge amount of money at stake because, as I say, uh, Switzerland pays 13 billion euro per year to be part of the family of the European Union, even being outside of that. But that's uh, a bill that no one has already made for the UK. It could be even much higher. And again, what is the advantage of all this mess? And since time is scarce, people are thinking that there will be eventually no agreement. This is something that is uh, realistically considered. Uh, the latest news talk about a transitional period. I don't know whether this can be decided. Vincent correctly pointed out that we make decisions one minute before the deadline is, expires, but that would imply a change of, of primary law because Article 50 is very clear in stating a deadline which is two years which can be renewed by, by two more years provided unanimously agreed by all 28 which is not the case so far. It is sufficient that a very small country in Europe says no that there won't be any, anything. But if this happens it will be as I see at the end a heaven for lawyers and hell for persons and, fear, and firms, because the problems, the legal problems attached to that will be enormous. So if any of you is in the law school and wants to deepen this topic, he will or she will have very good opportunities for her career. Thank you very much. Cyrus. Um, uh, Theresa is an associate professor in the economics department here at Dalhousie University. She received her PhD from the University of uh, Berkeley, California, where her dissertation focused on the relationship between trade, growth, and the effect of border, borders on trade. At Dalhousie, her research has continued to focus on international trade, particularly on the social and cultural impacts of trade. So she's going to provide uh, the economic um, sort of dimension of debate about Brexit. Theresa, please. Yes, I'm the token economist. <laughs> I'm also the token Canadian, I guess. Uh, there I am. Okay, good evening, everyone. So I'm here to talk to you about the implications of Brexit for Canada. And uh, I want to start by describing a scenario to you. So um, here's the scenario. An American president has threatened to raise trade barriers against the world in order to shore up the US economy. The United Kingdom has made a political decision that may hamper its trading relationship with Canada. But Prime Minister Trudeau has signed a trade deal with Europe. I'm referring, of course, to the events of the 1970s in which President Nixon raised tariffs um, on imports coming into the US or on, yes, on imports coming into the US. Uh, the UK joined the European community, which uh, had an impact on Canada, 
and the preferences that Canada enjoyed under the, as part of the Commonwealth. And uh, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau signed the Framework Agreement for Commercial and Economic Cooperation with the European Community. So what's old is new again. Now we have President Trump threatening to use trade policy to raise American interests above all else, including even a threat to abandon NAFTA. Um, UK, of course, is leaving the European Union, possibly putting its future trade with Canada at risk. And uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has uh, made a trade deal with the EU. Now, happily, the current trade agreement, CETA, uh, is, a, is a more powerful uh, and more important agreement than the weak agreement of the 1970s. Uh, but a trade agreement without the UK will have lower gains for Canada. The trade agreement uh, that Canada has signed with the European Union is the Comp Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, or CETA. And uh, it's been in the works for 10 years. It's been a very long, drawn-out negotiation period. Uh, but it will provisionally go into effect this month. CETA will eliminate uh, almost all tariffs on trade between Canada and the EU. So that means more competition, lower prices for Canadians. And um, it also means that lower tariffs that were lowered below their most favored nation uh, levels will be bound at those lower levels. So this does mean more certainty, more predictability for Canadians, uh, for Canadian firms. CETA also includes measures to foster regulatory co cooperation. Um, so what that means, for example, is that products that are produced in Canada, exported to the EU, can be tested for compliance with EU standards right here in Canada. So that, again, uh, increases um, certainty and predictability for firms. And it means lower costs for firms and therefore lower costs for, uh, for consumers. Um, CETA has temporary entry. Um, uh, provisions to facilitate labor mobility. One new thing that's in CETA is that municipal government uh, procurement is included and not only provincial or national government procurement. Um, that's, uh, is po it's possible that that will have an impact. It's likely that it probably won't have much of an impact because most procurement, so we're thinking here like things like buying new buses or um, a contract to build bridges or repair bridges. Those tend to be done by local firms anyway, or, or local subsidiaries of international firms. So well over 90% of procurement is, is done by local firms. So it remains to be seen whether this will have an impact or not. The most controversial part of CETA has been the investment uh, facilitation. Canada is quite open to foreign direct investment, so it's not necessarily going to inf affect investment very much in Canada, but the controversial part is the investor state dispute settlement mechanism, um, which many uh, researchers believe is actually an improvement on the process that, that we've had with NAFTA, which is quite ad hoc. Um, in any event, the uh, investment part of CETA will not go into effect right away. So we'll, we have to wait until the entire, uh, the entire EU ratifies the agreement. Now, Canada has always been a nation that relies on international trade. Our exports and imports together make up about two thirds of our GDP. Um, which actually puts us number two in terms of trade share in the, in, among the G7. So only, only Germany relies more on trade uh, than Canada does. In uh, 2016, our exports and imports together added up to over $1.3 trillion, which is $36,000 for every person in Canada. Um, now, clearly, with our relatively low population and our chilly northern climate, our climate, we have to trade to get the things that we want to consume as, uh, as individuals. And that's how economists view the gains from trade. We view the gains from trade as the greater variety of goods and services and the lower prices that our consumers can enjoy. Um, so that's the import side. Now the public and the government, for that matter, tend to focus on the gains from exports when they try to push through trade deals. 
And uh, it, is, it is the case that exports um, account for possibly 20% of all employment in Canada. But whether we look at trade from the export side or the import side, increased trade does lead to greater competitiveness and greater uh, productivity gains for Canadian firms. And that means increases in the standard of living for Canadian families. Our trade deals obviously have an impact on our trade. After the US-Canada Free Trade Agreement came in in 1989, our trade for, with the US really, really did rise. And at this point, about three quarters of our exports go to the US, and a little over half of our imports come from the US. Um, our trade with the EU is currently much lower due to geography primarily, as well as trade barriers. Um, but our trade with the UK has historically been very important to Canada and to Nova Scotia. Um, and the, the EU as a whole is now our second most important trading partner after the, the US, but they're quite a bit down. So our, uh, the US is, uh, comprises about 65% of our trade in total, and the EU comprises 10%. But that does make them our second most important trading partner as a whole. We're their 10th most important trading partner. So the EU is more important to Canada as a trading partner than we are, than we are to them. Uh, our main exports to the EU are metals, mineral products, machinery, and chemicals. And uh, many of these um, industrial products already have relatively low tariffs. Um, However, eliminating tariffs and providing the certainty that tariffs will be zero uh, will certainly raise trade. And from the point of view of Nova Scotia, removing the 8% EU tariff on live lobster uh, will have an impact uh, on us here. And the 3% the tariff on frozen fruit. So those are our top two exports from Nova Scotia to the EU. Now, obviously, what we're talking about tonight is Brexit, so let's focus on the EU. Uh, the EU is our top trading partner, or the UK is our top trading partner in the EU, so 43% of our EU-bound exports go to the UK. Um, in terms of imports, Germany is actually our number one source within the EU, um, but, but the UK is second, so 14% of our EU originating imports come from the UK. Um, and in total, 25% of our EU trade is with the UK, and, and Germany is number two with 21%. This is goods, goods trade only. So on the one hand, obviously it's very important that we continue or that we uh, adopt a CETA-like model in order to have free trade with the UK. That was actually what our CETA negotiations were predicated on, on, on having access to that UK market. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that CETA is worthless without the, without the UK. Economists think of two ways that um, trade can increase, along an intensive margin or an extensive margin. So the intensive margin means deepening existing trading relationships, and that's what a free trade deal with the UK would give us. Um, you know, we already trade a lot with the UK, so free trade would allow us to solidify those existing ties and, and allow trade fl flows to increase. But we also have a lot to gain from the extensive margin of trade, and that means developing new trading relationships. There are a lot of countries in the EU with which Canada does very little trade. The EU is a, is a huge market, so over 500 million people and you know 60 something million of those are in the UK but that's still a lot of people to trade with uh, it's a, a 20 trillion Canadian dollar GDP 10 times bigger than Canada's so this is still an important market for us to access this means that firms that already trade will face a reduced cost of market access and more firms will be induced to start trading or to explore new markets. And there is evidence that exporters are more productive. They become more productive. Firms that export become more productive by exporting. Firms that export invest more in physical capital, they invest more in human capital, and they are able to exploit economies of scale that, that these bigger markets give them access to. And that does mean increases in productivity in Canada, which we are in desperate need of. Okay. 
So what are the problems that we're going to see um, due to Brexit? One is that the European Commission decided that CETA is a mixed agreement, which means it can't just be voted on by the European Parliament, it has to be voted on by every national government within the EU. And um, only a handful have done that so far. So the UK was CETA's strongest proponent. And now, who is, who is CETA's champion within the EU? Um, Brexit obviously has to be at the foreground of negotiations. Um, so that means CETA's on the back burner. Okay. Now, it is being applied provisionally, but only the aspects regarding trade and goods. So everything else has to wait until every country has ratified the agreement. The second question that's already been discussed tonight uh, is how the UK will negotiate its EU trade agreement. So does that really mean starting from scratch? Or does that mean adopting CETA as the model and moving quickly into a trade agreement with the UK? Um, you know, some aspects can be easily adapt, ad adopted, like tariffs, but others are more problematic, like uh, agricultural quotas, which have been really contentious in the negotiations, and, and things like rules of origin. So rules of origin determine whether a good is counted as an EU good. So if it, with, you know, the global supply chains now, it's common for goods to have a little bit of production taking place in many different countries. So if part of a good is produced in Germany and part is produced in the UK, is that an EU good? Can it come into Canada free of tariffs? So this is, uh, this is something that can be negotiated. So we can determine rules of origin based on the cross accumulation of value added, but uh, it's not something that happens automatically. So this has to be part of a negotiation. And the EU has 38 trade agreements. So how is this going to work? Um, is every agreement going to start from scratch? So from Canada's point of view, the softer the Brexit, the better. I, I thought it was just soft versus hard, but evidently there's a continuum. So let's go to the soft side. But um, for now, we need to keep calm and trade off. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, thank you to the speakers. Now we open the floor to questions. Um, and uh, we'll start with individual questions, but there are, if there are quite a few, we're gonna collect them. So anybody want to break the ice? Yeah, please. In Canada, uh, last province to join Canada was Newfoundland. And to use a phrase I once heard when it came to amalgamating the credit unions in Newfoundland by also an Irishman, he said we had to keep them both until they get it right. And in Newfoundland's case, in fact, it's surprising how many people don't know but in fact, they voted twice. Um, why is it that this, I'll, I'll still call it a reasonably close vote, there's no conversations about giving the British voters an opportunity of voting on the deal itself when it's pulled together, or the divorce agreement. Thank you. Yeah, we can start with them. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very, very interesting question because if you think of member states like Denmark and Ireland who have had referenda on EU issues and they had second referendums indeed until they ratified them, there were various changes and commitments made. Um, I suppose at one level, I tried to reason this out myself last July when I was in, spent a fair bit of time in London, July 2016, in the immediate aftermath of the referendum. And I think it's almost something to do with the British psyche that it's okay, you know, keep calm and trade on. We voted, we may not like the outcome, but that's the vote. And it would be not cricket to expect that there'll be another vote until 
the right result came about. So there are an awful lot of people who were very firm remainers of the view, well, the people have voted and that's what we're going to do. Now, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is the, the role of Parliament and the sovereignty of Parliament, that if you actually have an, an act of Parliament and, you know, as Theresa May said in July of last year, well, Brexit means Brexit, therefore that's what's going to happen. And if that's the approach, then it does seem unusual to have not to have a second referendum or to have a vote on the final deal. I think a third point really is that the Labour Party or and the Liberals are not very strong. So the Labour Party has actually been very much of the view that it's hard at times to work out quite where they are, but they seem to be on the Brexit side of the House. So when you've got the majority of the Tories and the Labour Party on the Brexit side of the 650 members, and that's the preponderance of that, um, then you're most likely to continue on heading towards Brexit. Now, the arithmetic, however, of the fixed term parliament, which of course was broken this year, means that it is possible that the next British general election, depending on the timing of the deal, could be a proxy referendum. So you had one referendum in seven, June 75, you've had another one in June 2016. I wouldn't rule out the possibility of a third referendum, but much sooner than the earlier gap. Uh, so I think it's possible, but be so long as you have the Tories and the Labour Party both talking about Brexit, there just isn't enough, there aren't enough people talking about Remain or have a second referendum. And the Liberal Lib Dems, when they were uh, proposing and advocating that in the June, June general election, they didn't get very far with it. Okay, good question. Though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this one is specifically for Dr. Power. Um, you mentioned uh, that you that you felt like nobody made the case um, for Remain or, or for the EU in kind of the run of Brexit, and it reminded me of a lot of the postmortems that I read after the, the 2016 election in the United States that only you know, Hillary Clinton had carved out this positive economic vision, um, then they would have beaten Trump. And I don't know if I totally believe it, um, but I, I like the explanation that you provided. Um, just because I do remember people making that case, and I just felt like the case, for whatever reason, is less compelling for people. Um, I totally agree with you. I think the you know the comparison between World War II and 9/11 mm -hmm. is, is a very apt one. Um, but for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to resonate as well as kind of taking power back does. So if you could go back to let's say April or May 2016, and you're in the huddle with, with David Cameron, uh, what? How differently do you kind of articulate that case? And then as kind of a second partner, why is it that? For the people, who, as we were talking about the demographic breakdown of, of the Brexit vote, is that uh, baby boomers overwhelmingly voted to leave. Why is it that it's so tough to make the case that the EU has made the world better for the people who have been around the longest, if that makes sense? Yeah. Wow, uh, two very big questions. <laughs> um, the first one about, you know, what would you say to David Cameron in May uh, 2016? Um, I think I would remind him of Hillary Clinton's husband. He famously said, people vote not by what you tell them, but how you make them feel. And right through the few weeks, through March particularly, but April and May, and right through June, it was Project Fear. It was if you leave the European Union, it will cost you this amount of money. It will cost you, and there were you know, figures like £4,637 or whatever it was. It was almost quite precise. And when you have people who had suffered from the Northern Rock, Barclays, NatWest, Orbis, all of that sort of issue, and you had that sort of argument by Michael Gove, don't believe experts, and you had gone through a people who had gone through the the, the car crash of the recession. Fear wasn't going to work, and it didn't. What instead was being offered was almost a sort of an emotional, sort of visceral sort of idea. You can take back control. You can have sovereignty. You can decide things yourself. 
and you know, in a in an era when people have Facebook, Twitter, you know, Twitter as Donald Trump said is like owning your own newspaper without the losses. <laughs> you know, when people have want that sense of control, then it actually appealed very much to that sort of spirit. And you had silence from Brussels. Now they may have been they may have made a calculation and said, the more we get involved, the more we'll actually create a sort of a Pavlovian reaction a counter-reaction, but nobody made that case for the European Union. The fact that you know, students at UK universities can go anywhere in Europe uh, because of the Erasmus program, that the fact that yes, there are you know, 70 or so Spanish people retired in Britain, I think the figure is 70 or something, there are 70,000 British people in, uh, living in, in Spain in retirement. Um, but the media was very much contrary to the European Union and it was very difficult to get that sort of message of hope out there. Um, but it was needed and the language was very, very specific. When a British person went uh, and lived in Spain, they were an expat. When a Romanian came to live in Britain, they were a migrant. Um, so it was very difficult to get through that, but that, that language of hope was needed. The, the, the second part, um, just about the demographic aspects of it, the tipping point seems to be around the age of 43, um, plus or minus. Um, now, younger people were overwhelmingly in favour of Remain, but less likely to vote in a country where it's not compulsory to vote. So those who were more likely to vote were more likely to want to leave. Now, putting it maybe a little bit poetically or metaphorically, I suppose, to some extent, I, I think the UK wanted to get back to 1955. They wanted to get back to that moment just after the winning the Second World War, before Suez, with a hope of winning the World Cup in about 1966, <laughs> and driving around in a Morris Minor. <laughs> um, and in, at that era, when you think about it, you know, Churchill had spoken on the 9th of September 1946 at Zurich University about a United States of Europe. But it was a United States of Europe for everyone else. And I think the point was that you know, for countries like Ireland and countries like Malta and countries like Cyprus and so on, for them to join the European Union was a step up. For the UK, it was a step down. This was a victor of the Second World War, permanent member of the Security Council, and now they had the equality of Luxembourg or Slovakia or Slovenia, and they were on equal terms with them. And I think that is too much, and I think then, ultimately and finally, migration, uh, something that Canada doesn't understand because of your openness and, you know, you know being Irish, it was stunned when uh, Justin Trudeau came to Ireland and the statistic was used about, you know, t the population of Toronto, uh, you know, when I think it was a four times or five times it, it, it mushroomed because of the Irish migrants after the, the famine. Uh, this is something that a Canadian audience probably can't understand, the level of Call it xenophobia, call it fear, call it whatever you wish, uh, but there is a resistance towards migration. So I think that demographic uh, was actually quite important in that way as well. Hope that answers the two questions. Sorry, I can what were the, the last passive part of your question? What if if Brexit occurs, yes. like we're all here thinking Brexit is gonna occur and talking about it, a couple of times you said if Brexit occurs. Well do you mean it, whether this is a certainty or not? Yeah. Well, I, from the international legal viewpoint 
I believe, but I am a minority in legal scholars, that Article 50 of the Treaty on the European Union does not allow playing with the withdrawal. So once you have declared you want to go out, you cannot withdraw your declaration. Uh, because this would put the parties in a very unequal position. This would uh, uh, enhance strategic behavior by other European Union members, just playing with the, the threatening of withdrawal, and this would be very, very dangerous for the Union. But I think that um, the situation is so complicated and I don't want to have given the impression that I'm happy as a Remainer or a, or a person suffering Brexit uh, that it will be a bad, uh, a bad bargain for the UK. We are all sorry in Europe. Uh, I think there, there's no, it will be a lose-lose situation. And I am personally sorry about losing an important uh, partner and, uh, and member on, on which uh, we have been very much relying on in the past 40 and more years. And in, at, but if in good faith the, the parties realize that Brexit is going to be truly a problem and in a non an inextricable problem, for many, many reasons, and I just mentioned the, the millions of people which will be touched, but consider that, for instance, the British universities are those that get the most, the largest part of European financing for their research. Now, if you go to British universities, they are mad, mad about Brexit because they will lose a huge amount of money. And what will become uh, out of that? So if at the end of the day, there will be some realism in, 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 in UK politicians, which is not necessarily to be, give, to, be, to be taken for granted, not at least with the people we are, we are, we are used to, to hear in this period. Uh, I think that uh, if they say, sorry, we made a mistake, I think the other partners will overcome that legal constraint and be, okay, let's start from scratch. Um, that would be a good lesson for all your Europeans. Uh, it could be the proof that uh, rockers are prophets, like in Hotel California by the Eagles, you can check out any time you wish, but you can never leave. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, that's, uh, I think that at the end of the day, things have become so complicated that people are start hoping, are starting hoping that they will just say, sorry, we made a huge mistake. Just, just, just forget about the referendum. Or, as it was correctly pointed out, there may be some more, let's say, intelligent way to go out and ask for a second or further referendum on that to the British and get this uh, result through another vote. I think that, I was saying that during lunchtime with, uh, with, uh, with Ruben and Madeleine, I think that the issue is, uh, has to do with democracy. And your Supreme Court said that during, in the, in the judgment of 89 concerning the Quebec secession, you cannot ask people in a democracy to take such a decision, be, without explaining entirely the consequences of this decision. Vincent pointed out very clearly that it was a, a bunch of sorts of fake news to use a, a popular wording about Brexit. And people were totally kept ignorant on the consequences. And if I were a politician bearing the responsibility of guiding millions of people, I would just be more frank with that and not try to play with short-term electoral uh, success, talking about the Polish plumbers that have been taking out jobs to the British plumbers or whatever. This is fake. I mean, the number of immigrants, immigrants, of European citizens 
residing in the, in the EU is much less than other non-European persons living in the EU. And normally they are white collar people and or people doing jobs that British don't want to do anymore. So the fear for the Central Eastern Europeans that are burglars, thieves, uh, corrupt and so on is in the numbers, not real. But this has been played as a record constantly to people in order to push them for Brexit. And that is, uh, in my view, uh, uh, very, very sad from the politician point, uh, standpoint. They, they have a role and they have a responsibility they didn't bear in this situation. Okay. See, uh, I hope I have answered. I want to see if there's anybody else. I'll let first uh, I'll look at the mind. There's somebody in the back, please. Did you hear from that side the question? Anyway, maybe you can rephrase it just in case I haven't heard. I'm not sure that I told so oh, okay. firms within the UK yeah. how they're going to how they're going to how important the Well, I mean yeah, so I was focusing more on trade, but of course um, the UK pulling out of the EU means well, as Vincent pointed out, it's not just the movement of, of, uh, of goods, but also the movement of capital, of money as well. Um, so that does mean fewer sources of funds coming in for, uh, for investment, um, which, yeah, will definitely affect the capital markets within the, within the UK. Um, I mean, it all depends on how things are going to be negotiated. Because as I said, like Canada, we're very open to foreign direct investment. And it's, it's likely that, I mean, on a unilateral basis, not on the basis of any kind of agreement, right? Our, our trade agreement with the US does not have foreign direct investment as part of it. Um, so if the, if the UK is the you know, financial capital of, of Europe, wants to maintain open borders, um, in terms of capital flows, then that would mean, you know, not necessarily as much impact on in terms of investment in that sense. Um, so it all depends, I guess, right, on what kind of uh, what kind of system they want to move to. So. Thank you. Uh, I also have a question for Theresa, a very interesting presentation, all three presentations. Um, in, a, in a worst case scenario, Theresa, the worst case scenario of a hard Brexit, let's say in two or three years, um, is there any thinking in Canada as to how quickly we could enter into a trade agreement with the UK to preserve that special trading mm -hmm. relationship we have in that country? Well, according to um, according to what I uh, was reading this week with Theresa May's visit, the UK is not allowed to negotiate, right? I mean, so the you know as as long as the UK is part of the customs union um, with the EU, then they can't really have a different trading relationship with any other country. So. I, if people aren't aware of the difference between a free trade area and a customs union, so a free trade area means the countries within that grouping have no trade barriers among themselves. But a customs union means they have the same trade arrangements or the same trade barriers against outside countries. So right now, all of the countries in the EU have the same tariffs against Canada. Um, but if the UK were to you know, be on its own, then it would be 
starting from scratch then. So as, as long as it's, as, if it wants to maintain itself within the customs union, then there's no possibility of, of doing any negotiations. But from what, what I was reading this week from Theresa May, it really sounds as though we have to wait until 2019 before we can do any negotiating. We can't even sit down and have a discussion. So if it then means 10 years after that, the same length of time it took to negotiate CETA, then that's quite a long time. Pro probably in the solve. meantime, the WTO rules may be applied. But of course, it would be a major change in terms of uh, bilateral relationships. Of course, for us, it's not so much whether there are trade rules. There will be trade rules. But will they help us maintain the market shares that we have? That special preferential relationship that we enjoy as a result of the UK being part of the EU. I don't think there's been any discussion, over discussion. No. You know, that's the problem. I, I think just very quickly, I think the the incentives and the issues will vary quite considerably. Like, if you think the UK agriculture makes up about 0.75% of its GDP, agriculture on the other hand for the European Union is extremely important. Countries like France, uh, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Denmark and so on. <coughs> so, Belgium. Uh, Belgium, exactly. So when they come to negotiate, um, agriculture will be less important to the UK and it will actually be probably more interested in, in that side of the house at letting people, letting issues in. Whereas on the other side it goes the other way. Um, so it will be quite interesting. But the converse point is that I suppose it will be easier for Canada to negotiate with a market of 50 million because if you come with a market of 500 million on the other side, uh, the, you know, the most advanced, wealthiest internal market in the world, uh, you come and you negotiate against the 500 million person gorilla. Uh, it will be easier uh, from Canada's perspective to negotiate with the more slender UK, the skinny latte. Okay, we have time for the last three question, please. Yeah, so what state do you think will come forward after the power back to the black body UK, disregarding France and Germany? Hmm. Question to all the people. Can you repeat the question? Do you want me to repeat it? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what state do you think will come forward after the power back to the black body UK, oh. disregarding France and Germany? Okay. Cover some of the vacuum left by, uh, by the UK in terms of political dynamics within the EU, if any. What state will come forward? Yeah, country, I guess so. Country. country in particular, if Germany. Any. Germany no. is already ahead of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we will live into a, a, let's say, Germanized Europe. <laughs> and that's, that's going, th this is what is likely to happen. Uh, I think many, st it, it depends, because uh, I think that the, the legacy and the, the, the role of the UK will be divided uh, among many states. For instance, uh, I believe, and I think Vincent agrees, that one of the major, uh, one of the states that will have a major advantage from Brexit will be Ireland, because it is close because it is close to the US and the Northern American uh, countries, because it is an English-speaking country, and because uh, multinational enterprises have a very good environment to be there. As far as banking sector is concerned, I think that many will move to Germany. Uh, and uh, in other areas, uh, what will be left out by the UK will be, will be taken by other countries. Uh, in terms of political power, Germany has uh, gained a substantial advantage. And please believe that it was very, very uh, uh, correct what Vincent pointed out earlier, namely that the UK has made a strong contribution to the, to the Union, but always in a semi-detached way. So it was a, a sort of counterpart. It was never a leader in the Union. And I think France 
is no longer as strong as it was, even though they claim to be, but in fact it is not the case. Germany has grown in strength enormously after the reunification, so there is no, no comparison. They, in Europe, there's always this saying, this uh, French-German, let's say, axis that brings uh, Europe forward. This is not the case. And uh, I think Germany has taken the lead and will keep the lead for a while. The last thing? Very quickly. Uh, first of all, just to agree entirely uh, with the idea of Germany is already there. I'm reminded of a, of a comment made by an English footballer, uh, Gary Lineker, who said, soccer is a game which you play for two halves of 45 minutes, and in the end, the Germans win. <laughs> um, so I think they're already in a very strong position. I think France is trying, and if you look at Macron's speech in uh, Athens last week, I think they're trying to carve out a role for themselves, but I'm not sure it'll be there. Thirdly, I think the UK, if it leaves uh, the European Union, it may well try to establish another form of trade agreement or trade area, uh, just as it did with EFTA, uh, when it had seven members in EFTA and the European Economic Community had six. It was at a time when it was said Europe was at sixes and sevens. And they may try to form some sort of trade bloc with the likes of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and a number of other member states in, in, in Europe, perhaps. Or, sorry, states in Europe. Uh, and finally, just to say about Ireland, I think that, uh, sorry, penultimately just to say about Ireland, I think it will be a beneficiary. I think there will be severe shocks. I think like joining in 73, there were certain industries which disappeared. I think there will be certain industries which were really badly affected by Brexit. But at the moment, the value of US foreign direct investment in Ireland is actually more than the value of US foreign direct investment in Brazil, Russia, India, and China combined. And that's very much part of the, as Francesco was saying, English speaking, common law, European member state. And I think that's going to continue there. The last part is I do hope the UK will come back if they leave. But I think the great problem is that there may be a real shock and a real problem to get them back in. Because if it goes well, they'll stay out. But if you want to hope that they'll go back in, unfortunately, this is going to have to be nightmare on Leadenhall Street. With that very uh, sort of uh, gloomy last uh, <laughs> note, I'd like to again thank the, uh, uh, the speakers of today, very engaging. Um, the talk. So, thank you. Thank you.